Welcome, this is Katie at the Assisi Institute, and today I will be interviewing Isha Das, and we are discussing Martin Luther King in honor of Martin Luther King Day. Thanks for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Katie, being here with you, and thank you for interviewing me. You're welcome. When did you first become interested in the life of Martin Luther King? Well, I, I remember very specifically, I was 12 years old when he was assassinated, and they played a lot of his speeches on TV. And I have to admit, first I was just uh, drawn to his um, oratory skills and what a powerful speaker he was. But I think even at that age, I recognized that there was, it wasn't just that he was a good speaker, that there was an energy and a force behind his words that I had never experienced from anyone else, listening to anyone else in my life before that. And so not too long after that, I, I got a biography on his life. And I have to say, I think that was the first biographical book I have ever read was on the life of, of Dr. Martin Luther King. And to be honest with you, I have been a, a fan of his, a student of his, uh, an admirer for sure ever since then. I think he played an important role in America. I think when he was alive, he was the moral conscience of America. And I think he still stands very tall in the American consciousness. Yes. And how do you think his example influences your life today? Well, it's a big question, and I don't know if I can answer it specifically. Let me just kind of think out loud with you. First of all, again, I, I'm inspired by the fact that, and intrigued that there's this force that was behind his words and his message and his work that I think was bigger than the man. The way I, 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 the way I say it to people is I truly think that Dr. King was a modern day prophet that there, again there was a force and an energy behind him that I really believe was the energy of God and the spirit of God. So in my own life as a aspiring spiritual person, as a person who practices Kriya Yoga, as a Christian, like Dr. King, I want to be inspired by that same energy. I want to live by the truths and the spirit that he lived by. That doesn't mean I'm going to be doing the same exact work, but he inspires me to be open to that very same spirit that he was open to. And, and to be honest with you, anybody that calls themselves a conscientious Christian or Jew or Muslim or Kriyaban should endeavor to be open to the same spirit and the same energy that guided him. That's true. In what way do you think his message is relevant today? Well, I, I think it's relevant, in some ways, more relevant today than ever. Let me just sort of start out at a basic level. There's still a level of racism, discrimination, uh, structural racism in our culture. So certainly that voice of his that spoke to racism is still relevant. Secondly, what a lot of people don't realize is at the end of his life, the last year or two before he was assassinated, his message became larger and more expansive. He talked about poverty. He talked about the cost of the Vietnam War and the whole military complex and the money and the energy that it was taking away from the poor and other worthwhile programs and what it was doing to the sort of moral soul of the, of the country. So that his message wasn't only about racism, it was also speaking to a lot of other relevant issues um, that we are facing today. I mean, we still have, um, we're still in Afghanistan in a war today. And, but I think even more poignantly, we live in a very divided country where we divide ourselves by race, by class, by culture, by gender, we've, we've really almost digressed into a tribal kind of consciousness. And, and Dr. King was anything but tribal. Let me say it this way, that I, I think Dr. King embodied the 
evolutionary trajectory where I think the Spirit of God is trying to lead us. He really, I think, stands before us as an elder evolutionary brother embodying the consciousness that we need right now. He saw things in a way that most of us do not see things. He experienced life in a way that most of us don't experience life. Let me read a quote from his, it's taken from his letter from a Birmingham jail. And this this captures part of the essence of, again, his consciousness that I think is so needed now because we're so tribal. Quote, We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of identity. Whatever affects one affects all indirectly. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds, end of quote. So I think that particular message speaks so loudly because, again, we live in such a tribal culture. And it's not that our our ethnic differences shouldn't be acknowledged and celebrated. It's not that our cultural differences shouldn't be acknowledged and celebrated. But at the same time, what needs to be acknowledged is that we really are one race. And we're drawing our life from the one source of life, which is God. So at the deepest and most profound level, we are really one. We are really brothers and sisters. And it's not just a hallmark, you know, sentimental sort of notion. It was the consciousness that I believe Dr. King embraced. That's why I say he's the embodiment of where we need to evolve as a human family. We need to, it's good to, don't misunderstand me, it's very good to honor Dr. King Um, But it's more important to follow him. It's more important to expand our hearts and our minds so that we can live from the same level of consciousness that he lived. The world needs more people who see and feel from their hearts, who see and feel from that one singular source of life that, that is the ground of everybody's existence. We need more people to live from that, or I'm I'm not sure that we're going to survive as a a species. So in that sense, I think his his message today is is in some ways more relevant than it's ever been. Right. And as an individual, how can people take on his energy and his consciousness in their day-to-day activities? That's a great question, Katie. It's a great question. Let me go to, to well, something about Dr. King, and then I want to tie it into to, um, Kriya Yoga and what we teach here at the Assisi Institute. Dr. King, if we see Dr. King primarily as a political person, we're not, we're not really seeing him in his essence and who he was from the full picture. If we see him only as an activist, again, we're not seeing him from the full picture. We have to remember he was an ordained minister. He was a deeply spiritual person. So that part of what inspired this broad consciousness that included and embraced everyone, part of what inspired that was his connection to spirit with a capital S his connection to the divine. He was drinking from a well of spiritual consciousness and energy that really inspired and moved him. He, probably the most accurate way to say it from my perspective, he saw things with the, through the eyes of God. And so in, in Kriya Yoga, what we, what we teach is that, first of all, we have to make that conscious contact with God if we want to see with the eyes of God, if we want to feel um, with the heart of God. It's not something that we can conjure up by ego strength alone. We have to tap into, as I believe Dr. King did, we have to tap into a higher consciousness. So again, what we teach in Kriya Yoga, that begins with silence. It begins with meditation. See, when we go into meditative silence, it's not just about being quiet. Two things happen. The filters, the lens by which we see reality, the stories that we tell about ourselves and other people, 
in that sacred silence, they, they all fall away. And in that silence, then we begin to see with fresh eyes. We begin to hear with fresh ears. It's like we see for the very first time reality as it is. So I think, again, the first thing in terms of being able to adopt or, or to adapt or open ourselves up to the consciousness that Dr. King experiences is to look to a spiritual source and then to tap into that spiritual source through meditative silence and through prayer. The second thing is we have to allow ourselves to have a warm heart. And again, that's much more than a, a sentimental concept. I believe if you read the writings of Dr. King and listen to his speeches, when he was with people who were suffering, he suffered. I guess we call that nowadays empathy. It's the ability to enter into someone else's pain. I believe his heart was so big and so large that he felt the pain of other people. And because he felt the pain of other people, he was moved to address their pain. He was moved to challenge those structures that were causing the pain. See, once our hearts really open and we begin to feel other people's pain, no one has to tell us to be generous. No one has to tell us to be fair. No one has to tell us to be moral. We will want to do the right thing. We will want to heal the pain of other people's because we recognize that our own destiny and our own pain is tied up with their destiny and their pain. We realize that we are one. So I think it's the willingness to have an open and fleshy heart, a warm heart. It's the willingness to be vulnerable to reality and not wall ourselves into some sort of prison where we don't see and feel the reality of, of pe real people in our lives. And I think the other piece, maybe this ties it all together. It's what is our underlying um, intention in life? What is our underlying purpose? I think at a very early age, Dr. King was moved to help heal racism, to lift African Americans out of the oppression that they were in, and he gave his whole life over to that. Let me say it this way, you know, I, I always tell people, don't make happiness the goal, because as long as you make happiness the goal, it becomes very elusive. It's sort of like nailing jello to a tree. It, it doesn't really stick. The important thing is to make your life meaningful. And in the spirit of Dr. King, I think our lives truly become meaningful when we make the decision to serve something other than ourselves. We become bigger by serving something that is larger than ourselves. And so I think we can, we can take on the evolutionary consciousness of Dr. King by, by choosing to, to, again, serve something larger than ourselves. You know, my favorite Catholic saint is Francis of Assisi. And that prayer of St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. If every day we begin our, our day with that as a prayer and as a soulful intention, Lord, make me a channel of your peace. Lord, make me an instrument of your love. Make me an instrument of your light. Make me an instrument of your justice. If we begin each day with that intention, then, again, the spirit and the wind that was at the back of Dr. Martin Luther King and that was inspiring him, that same spirit will be the wind at our back moving us and inspiring us. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mean to give such a long <laughs> answer to your question. It's a beautiful answer, and it's very inspiring. What would you say is the essence of his message? Well, the essence of his message, I'll go back to the quote and to paraphrase, paraphrase the quote that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I think the essence of his message is the realization that in the context of God's love, in the context of God's consciousness, 
we are we are really all one and that separation the sense of divisiveness and division is is really an illusion that that reality really is one and not just in some psychological way but again tapping into spirituality is that you know the energy that is sustaining me really comes from God the life force comes from God and it's the very same energy and life force that is sustaining you we're all drinking from the same well of life so as we as we as we drop our dualistic thinking and begin to look at things in a non-binary way or in a unitive way then we really are embracing the essence of his message so let me say it this way i think the essence the essence of his message or his philosophy at the very core is that it's non-dualistic it's able to see with the eyes of the heart that everything is one everything is connected um, it's 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 living the words of Jesus that whatever you do unto the least of my brothers and sisters you do unto me again not as a hallmark greeting but as a living reality I think that is the essence of his of his message and then from that comes civil rights come from that comes the movement towards righteousness um, and the movement towards right action the movement towards justice but it begins I think with that spark that we are one it's that non-dual consciousness which I really think is the essence of his message and his philosophy and again I think I want to believe that the human race is evolving and more and more of us are beginning to enter into um, at least flirting with that non-dual consciousness we don't need everybody to be in that state of consciousness we just need enough of us to be in that, to tilt the world in the right direction. Right. Do you see any tension in being a white person espousing the ideals and thoughts of such a prominent African American? Well, that's another great question. And I guess I have two answers. First of all, I think I have to approach Dr. King in his writings and his message with humility, that I don't know it all and that um, as a white person I really can't exactly identify with the black experience. Right. So I have to approach it with, with humility and I have to listen to what other people have to say, particularly people of color. So that's my first response. Secondly, I do believe, and I think this is in the spirit of Dr. King, I do believe we have more in common um, than what differentiates us and what separates us. Uh, I think love, for example, there's no such thing as black love or white love or yellow love or gay love or straight love. There's just love. Right. And, and because God is love. And love is the energy that emanates from the heart of God. And it's a universal phenomenon. So at, a, at, a, at another level, um, we have much more that unifies us. And again, the, you know, what Dr. King, what part of what drove his message was he called it soul force. In fact, he talks about that in his I Have a Dream speech. And then he defines soul force as the marriage of love and truth. And again, love doesn't know color, neither does truth. Truth is truth, and love is love. And they're really flip sides of the same coin, and they're really both the energy and the presence of God in time and space, and they transcend differences. So I think as a white person, again, starting out with humility, starting out with the willingness to listen and hear other people's experience, if I'm constantly coming from a place of love and I want the truth, not what I want and not what I want the truth to be, but when I want the truth and I'm motivated by love, then we really have much more in common and we transcend our, our differences. Right. I like that. Social media is a huge part of our life today. What do you think the pros and cons are of social media in, in this topic, in civil rights? And well, you know, social media, I, I, I compare it to, and I'm not the only one that has said this, um, 
it's as revolutionary for human culture as the invention of the printing press was. I, I don't think we've begun to unpack like what podcasts and, and the effect that that is happening, how people are listening to podcasts now more than they're reading books. Right. So I think in general, the impact of social media um, on our culture is, again, revolutionary. And it's, it's a mixed bag. It's like anything. It's a gift, but the gift can be misused and the gift can be used in a good way. So, A, I think that people, I encourage people who use social media, even Facebook, and I'm not, not even talking about people who, you know, do podcasts, but Facebook, uh, Instagram, that challenge people, I challenge people to come from the highest good to go back to come from love and truth um, and and to have their messages come from love and truth and then secondly I think we have to be discerning you know we can't believe everything that we read or he, not read but hear on Facebook or on social media so we have to be willing to to be discerning and is is great is a revolutionary thing that social media is I don't think it can ever really replace a book. There's something about the energy of a book and the consciousness that you hold in a book that is different uh, that I don't think you can capture with social media. So I, I encourage people to, to continue to read. But particularly in this context, read the writings of Dr. Martin Luther King. Read what he himself had to say and wrestle with it in your own mind and heart. Um, that is the the ultimately the best way go to the source itself and there's still something about the written word and thank God that we have Martin Luther King's written words go to the words themselves digest the words themselves um, that way you know you're getting it in an accurate way and I think it, it sinks into our pores and our DNA a little bit more when we approach it that way right and lastly as a parent how can I go home and motivate my children to have that spirit of Martin Luther King? Well, I think there are two ways that we do that. And the first way is probably the most important. You know, the, the spirit of Dr. King can't be taught. It's mm -hmm. only caught. Okay. Okay? And what do I mean by that? I mean that we have to embody the consciousness that he embodied. We have to live it. We have to breathe it with our children. They have to feel it coming from us. Now, again, Dr. Martin Luther King was not a perfect person. He himself said he was not a saint. It's not about being perfect. But, you know, kids are very intuitive. They, they haven't developed some of the editorial filters that we develop. They know when we're coming from our heart. They know when we're being genuine. They know when we're being loving and fair and truthful. So I think we just have to embody it with them and our interactions with them and how they see us interacting with the world and other people. They have to feel it. They have to sense it. Um, it has to be in the air they breathe. That's why I say it's caught. It's not taught. And then I think secondly, once we are living it and they feel it, then we do put words on it for them. We make it sort of mindful. We make it intelligent in that way. We put words on it. And, and the words could be sharing, you know, listening to a speech of Dr. King, reading some of his writings, reading some of the writings of Gandhi who had a big influence on, on Dr. King. Um, so it is sharing those, those words and those teachings once we're living it with them so that it just becomes, you know, part of their world. Just as an example, you know, I grew up in a time in the Catholic Church. I was raised Catholic when Catholics were finally encouraged to read the Bible and I, my family attended Bible studies. So I, I grew up with biblical phrases, just part of my mental construct. And even to this day, you know, quotes of Jesus are always going through my head. And I guess I'm saying it's the same thing with the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King and other people like them. Introduce your children to them at an early age. Make it just the everyday part of the fabric of your family's life. Same thing with the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, 
who we who we honor at the Assisi Institute and teaches Kriya Yoga within the Assisi Institute, let their words and their teachings just almost in a natural way, not in a pontificating way, let them just become part of the fabric of of your family life. And then again, your kids catch them. It just becomes part of their of their DNA. It, it's just natural. But it, it always starts with our willingness to live it and to and to embody it in our words and our behavior. Thank you. That's very inspiring. Good. I want to just you have any more questions? That's it. Well, I, t- I just want to close with this because we can, we can look at the life of Dr. Martin Luther King and we can say, well, he did all these big things. I could never do those big things. To paraphrase Mother Teresa, it is not doing big things, but it's doing small things with great love so that really everything we do makes a difference. See, once we get the understanding that everything is connected, our words are connected to other people's consciousness, our thoughts are even connected to other people's consciousness. Once we really get that we are connected, then we realize everything we do, good or bad, tilts the world in one direction or the other. So again, it's not about doing great things. It's about doing everyday, ordinary things with great love. So how we treat the, quote unquote, the little people, how we treat our children, how we treat our spouses, how we treat the checkout young man or young woman at the grocery store? Do we smile? Do we treat people with dignity? Do we treat them with compassion? Do we tell the truth? Everything that we do with that spirit tilts the world in the direction of everything that Dr. King lived and embodied. So again, it's not about doing great things. It's about doing ordinary things with with great love. And we all really make a difference everything we do makes a difference so I don't want people to think that again they have to do great things it's doing everything with great love and all the little things that we do really do make the world a better place they add to the light in the world one more piece I will add and this isn't very popular in today's thinking and in today's world you know Dr. King and many of his fellow civil rights workers and and friends they made great sacrifices sometimes they were they were beaten up um, they were jailed and and they were killed dr king was assassinated there is this whole notion that he taught about redemptive suffering that being a peacemaker being a person of evolutionary consciousness doesn't mean that life is always going to be easy or pleasant that sometimes we will suffer for the right things, but that suffering does make a difference. It, it is redemptive. It somehow, again, tilts the world in the right direction. That's why I think I said earlier in, it, in, in, in this interview, it's not about searching for happiness and making happiness the goal. It's, it's about meaningfulness, making meaningfulness the goal. And yes, sometimes, if we seek to live a meaningful life, if we seek to live some, to live for something bigger than ourselves, we will suffer. We will be misunderstood. We will be persecuted. But somehow that's redemptive. Somehow that transforms the consciousness of the world. And the more that we transform the consciousness of the world, the more that we make the world a better place, the more we bring Dr. King, Dr. King's dream closer to realization. Thank you, Katie, for this time, and thank you for interviewing me. I I hope you've enjoyed these words, and may God bless you and keep you, and the divine in me bows before the divine and everyone else. Have a great day. Thanks.